So on this note, uh, I'd like to kind of come uh, to, to introduce uh, Dr. Novak. Uh, I'm a bit of a fanboy to because of your TED talk. So, uh, so, so, doc, so we had an opportunity uh, to, uh, to, to be aware of Dr. Novak's work really early on when we started engaging both as a government and as a community around what open data and open government could do uh, for our province. Uh, Dr. Novak's the founder and director of the Governance Lab and it's uh, MacArthur Research Network on, on opening governance. Uh, the GovLab strives to improve people's lives by changing how we govern. Uh, it designs and tests technologies, policies, and strategies to foster a more open and collaborative approach to strengthen the ability of people and institutions to work together to solve problems, make decisions, resolve conflicts, and govern themselves more effectively and legitimately. Uh, in addition to being the Jacob K. Javits Visiting Professor at New York University's Robert F. Wagner Graduate School of Public Service, a visiting professor at the MIT Media Lab, uh, Beth is also a professor of law at New York Law School. A uh, graduate of Harvard University and Yale Law School, she serves on the Global Commission on Internet Governments and chairs the ICANN Strategy Panel on Multi-Stakeholder Innovation. She also served in the White House as the first United S uh, States Deputy Chief Technology Officer and Director of the White House Open Government Initiative. And one of the things, and, and I'm sure we'll see it come through the presentation, but this idea, we're a province of you know, barely 800,000 people, so which for me is a great advantage when I think about it. Uh, because of the nimbleness it offers. But governments are the same across the world, right? We're subject to the same pressures. It doesn't matter if, you, you know, if, if there's 300 million or, or, or 50,000 people. The pressures of politics, the community, all of those realities are the same. So really looking forward to that ex experience and, and, uh, and that context. Uh, the UK Prime Minister David Cameron appointed her as Senior Advisor for Open Government. Uh, she also served on the uh, Obama-Biden transition team. Amongst projects she's designed and, or collaborated on are Unchat, uh, the Do Tank, peer-to-patent, peer to uh, data.gov, uh, challenge.gov, and the GovLabs Living Labs and Training Platform. That was named one of the Foreign Policy 100 by Foreign Policy, uh, one of the 100 most creative people in business by Fast Company, and one of the top women in technology by uh, the, Huff the Huffington Post. She's also been honored both by the National Democratic Institute and by Public Knowledge for her work in civic technology. She's the author of Wiki Government: How Technology Can Make Government Better, Democracy Stronger, and Citizens More Powerful, and co-editor of The State of Play, Law Games and Virtual World. Her next book, The Network State, will appear with Harvard University Press shortly. Uh, will you please help me warmly welcome um, Beth Novak. Beth. Thank you very much. It is a great pleasure to be here. Um, so when I arrived at the White House, now we're going to hear a little bit about this culture of government and how it is, I want to start with this, how I think it is the same the world over, sadly. When I arrived at the White House at the start of the first Obama administration, I was fresh from serving as a volunteer on what had been the most successful internet-based campaign in history, full of that optimism that the minister spoke about. Quand je suis arrivée à la Maison Blanche au commencement de la première administration Obama, J'étais fraîchement débarquée de la campagne électorale de l'ère Internet la plus réussie de l'histoire, campagne où j'avais servi en tant que conseillère bénévole. OK, so I'm going to try to do this in both for a little bit. All right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you may actually all want to rush for the translation headphones, depending on uh, <laughs> how bad my French is. Um, the Obama presidential campaign in 2007-2008 had, of course, invited its supporters to blog freely on the campaign's website. We'd set up wikis that we dubbed idea raisers to invite policy proposals from over 5,000 distributed experts across the country. Volunteers on the West Coast had set up their own campaign offices, not under the centralized control of Chicago's office, but they were enthusiastically welcomed nonetheless. Techies volunteered their time and their talents to build tools to get out the vote. The campaign, la campagne présidentielle d'Obama en 2007 et 8 avait invité ses supporters à poster librement sur le site blog de la campagne et avait mis en place des wikis que nous avions surnommés idiateurs pour encourager l'envoi des propositions politiques auprès de 5000 experts répartis aux quatre coins du pays. Les bénévoles de la côté ouest ont mis en place le propre quartier général their headquarters, the campagne. Il n'était pas sous le contrôle du bureau central de Chicago, mais leur présence était, le, euh, était bienvenue. Des programmeurs donnaient leur temps et leur talent pour construire des outils de prédiction d'intention de vote. After the election and before the inauguration, we set up history's first transparent presidential transition website. 
It was intended to inform and to engage the American people in the process of planning the first 100 days of the new administration, asking people to submit both their questions and their ideas. Après l'élection et avant l'investiture, nous mettions en place pour la première fois de l'histoire un site web pour l'équipe de transition, avec un accent sur la transparence dans le but d'informer et de faire participer le peuple américain au processus de préparation des 100 premiers jours de la nouvelle administration. Nous encourageons les gens à nous envoyer leurs questions et leurs idées. But come January 21st, 2009, all this stopped. Après le 21 janvier 2009, patata, tout cela s'est arrêté. We might have been on top of the world, yet we were running Windows 2000. Ooh. I don't have to translate that. The lack of technology infrastructure was only part of the reason. Overzealous security mavens blocked all our social media sites. Les lacunes technologiques étaient seulement une des raisons des experts en sécurité un peu trop zélés décidèrent de bloquer tous nos sites de médias sociaux. The president had to exert his authority as leader of the free world to be allowed to keep the device. Gift restrictions intended to prevent corruption and bribery came to mean that we could not accept open source software, procuring any new social media tool, with the requisite accessibility and security protections and installing it on White House servers could take a year or more. The president du exercer son autorité de, uh, du leader du monde libre afin d'être autorisé à garder son Blackberry. Les directives sur la restriction des cadeaux, un principe destiné à prévenir des faits de corruption, nous empêchaient d'utiliser, par exemple, des logiciels libres. L'accès des outils de gestion de nos médias sociaux, compte tenu des impératifs d'accès, de sécurité pour les serveurs de la Maison Blanche, allait prendre 12 mois, voire plus. Free speech concerns over government moderating an online forum, and PR concerns if we failed to moderate and allowed comments about UFOs from about the president's birth certificate to proliferate could have stopped us all together in our tracks. So I, I have some slides about this. There's our, sorry, almost forgot about that. Les préoccupations liées aux libertés de parole et aux pensées, le premier amendment, dans le cadre de la modération des médias sociaux et les problèmes de com, de com si nous laissions passer des commentaires sur les ovnis, les UFOs, ou l'extrait d'acte de naissance du président, auraient pu nous stopper net. Such insular practices, and this will sound still familiar to many people, were entirely common. De telles pratiques étaient notre lot quotidien. Outsiders cannot see in, and White House employees cannot see out because of the thick, gauzy bomb blast curtains that are designed to catch the shattered glass in case of an explosion. Mobile phones, in many cases, must be left outside the door in open wooden cubby holes. Les gens du dehors ne peuvent pas voir à l'intérieur et les employés ne peuvent pas voir à l'extérieur du fait des épais rideaux censés bloquer les débris de verre en cas d'explosion. En plusieurs cas, les téléphones mobiles doivent être laissés à l'entrée enfermés dans les petits cajibis en bois. Even though few people in a White House office or even a few thousand in federal agencies do not possess all the expertise necessary, to devise policies on technical and complex subjects. Uh, the high, uh, excuse me, when we got to Washington, we found that it was frowned upon to be what was called forward leaning. That is, to tip one's hat to any forthcoming policies by publicly discussing them prior to the draft making its rounds let alone to be in any way experimental. Il y a certes quelques personnes à la Maison Blanche et sans doute quelques certaines au sein des agences fédérales qui ne possèdent pas toute l'expertise nécessaire ni pour la création de politiques ni pour l'exécution des projets sur des sujets techniques et complexes. Quand même, mais quand nous sommes arrivés à la Maison Blanche, nous avions réalisé que le forward leaning, c'est-à-dire une attitude proactive, qui consiste à donner des indications sur les politiques à venir en discutant, discutant certains éléments afin de la rédaction du texte final, n'était pas bien vu du tout, tout de même un esprit expérimental. We wanted to consult the American people and the civil service in advance of crafting our new policy on opening government. If we were going to develop far-reaching plans, not simply to make the workings of government more transparent, but also to invite people to participate in policy making and to work together to develop creative strategies for addressing complex problems, it seemed only natural to formulate a course of action in an open way, open government formulated openly. 
Nous souhaitons consulter le peuple américain et la société civile avant de rédiger des textes sur le gouvernement ouvert. Si nous étions en train de développer des plans de long terme, mais pas seulement pour que le travail de l'État soit plus transparent, mais aussi pour inviter les citoyens à participer à la politique et à la travailler ensemble pour trouver des solutions innovantes à des problèmes complexes. Il nous paraissait normal de définir ces plans d'action de la façon la plus transparente qui soit. But the idea of an institution as hidebound, as conservative as the White House, actively involve, in, excuse me, involving rank and file government employees, let alone the public, before instead of after a plan was written, was utterly unheard of. Mais l'idée que institution aussi rigide que la Maison Blanche puisse faire participer ses employés, encore pire la peuple américain tout entier, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Cold. <coughs> à l'élaboration d'un texte avant que celui ne soit écrit, c'était du jamais vu. By the time a draft policy typically goes out the door to the public, or even to federal agency leadership, the fully approved document has been thoroughly reviewed by countless lawyers and policymakers across each component of the executive office of the president, and often multiple agencies. Typiquement, au moment du public, ou même la direction d'une agence fédérale a connaissance d'un projet de texte de loi, la version finale du texte a déjà été copieusement discutée et modifiée par une batterie d'avocats et de politiques au sein du Executive Office of the President et de plusieurs agences gouvernementales. Until that vetting is complete, the document is considered deliberative and is usually marked as such, meaning confidential work product under deliberation and not subject to public disclosure. Jusqu'à cet examen soit complète, la texte est considérée comme en délibéré et notée en tant que telle, que ce, ce que signifie qu'il s'agit d'un travail confidentiel en cours et donc pas approprié pour, tout, pour, pour une divulgation publique. Before undertaking any kind of information collection, think survey, a little-known statute, I hope you don't have this here, called the Paperwork Reduction Act, the bête noire of the, paper, of the civil service, that is its name, ironically, requires agencies to go through a time-consuming, paper-filled pro approval process. In every case, a ministry has to pay a fee to publish its notices of public consultation, of citizen consultation, in the Federal Register, the daily newspaper of government. Avant de pouvoir prendre part à toute forme de collecte d'informations, sondage par exemple, une disposition législative méconnue, le Paperwork Reduction Act, bête noire de toute fonctionnaire, force les agences gouvernementales à une laborieuse procédure d'agrément. Oh, thank you, hugely. Oh, there we go. I'm sorry. <coughs> my cold, it makes it worse than my French. <clears throat> Avant de pouvoir, oh, so where were we here? Um, okay. Uh, uh, force the, so the Paperwork Reduction Act forces les agences gouvernementales à une laborieuse procédure d'agrément. Pour chaque cas, un ministère doit s'acquitter d'un droit d'enregistrement et publier un avis de consultation des citoyens dans le Federal Register, notre journal officiel. Paperwork reduction notwithstanding, in 2009, a White House official did not have easy access to effective tools for public engagement. The White House did not have a blog yet, let alone a Facebook or Twitter account. Far from it. We were saddled with an arcane and barely functioning website inherited from the Bush administration, whose idea of openness was to make a video of the White House Christmas tree from the vantage point of Barney, the first dog. <clears throat> we had to contract with another organization to host a simple online brainstorm. De fait, en 2009, la Maison Blanche n'avait pas d'outils simples pour faire participer les citoyens. Pas de blog, pas de Facebook, pas de Twitter non plus. Euh, en revanche, nous avions sur les bras un site web ARI qui fonctionnait à peine, héritage de l'administration Bush, dont l'esprit d'ouverture s'était traduit par une vidéo du sapin de Noël de la Maison Blanche, filmée du point de vue de Barney, uh, GoPro, avant GoPro, le chien présidentiel. Du coup, nous avons dû faire un partenariat avec une agence uh, ex, uh, externe pour faire héberger un simple outil de brainstorming en ligne. Up until that point, and sadly beyond. Political leaders often invoke national security, 
privacy as well, to justify shutting off access to websites and tools that could have enabled public servants to speak to or hear from the public. À cette époque, et même après, malheureusement, nos leaders politiques invoquaient bien souvent la sécurité nationale pour justifier l'interdiction de sites web ou de l'utilisation d'outils pour aider les services de l'État à communiquer et sécuriser les citoyens. The Obama administration has done somewhat better job of broadcasting how it works, with the exception in many cases of some national security matters, but in large part by posting the logs of those who visited the White House online, oops, that's where they are, uh, and holding occasional video chats with senior officials where the public can submit questions to be answered. But pushing innovation out hardly translated or translates into a willingness to invite more information, more ideas, and more voices in. L'administration Obama a fait mieux de ce point de vue-là en ouvrant son mode de fonctionnement à l'exception des sujets liés à la sécurité nationale, par exemple en publiant la liste des visites de la Maison Blanche ou en organisant des video chats avec ministre des hauts fonctionnaires au cours desquels le public a été invité à poser des questions. Mais publier de l'information ne signifie pas forcément une volonté réelle d'inviter de nouvelles idées ou de nouvelles voix dans le débat. To this day, there remains no meaningful transformation in the relationship between citizen and state. Despite all the technological advances, governing is still the domain of professionals working behind closed doors. À ce jour, il n'y a toujours pas eu de vraie transformation de la relation entre l'État et le citoyen. Malgré les avances technologiques, gouverner reste le précaré de professionnels qui travaillent dans l'ombre. Public consultation is routinely practiced, of course, formerly routinely practiced, but typically only after the fact, as a way to fine-tune an already formulated plan or to sell the public on it to ease subsequent implementation. La consultation publique est certes une pratique courante, mais typiquement a posteriori, comme une façon de peaufiner un plan déjà décidé et de vendre aux citoyens afin de faciliter son adoption. In short, citizens have virtually no influence on decision making, and agencies realize no benefits from them from their talents, their know-how, their expertise. En gros, les citoyens n'ont aucune influence sur les processus de décision et les agences de l'État ne bénéficient aucunement de leur participation. What one scholar calls a participatory bureaucracy is something that we lack, or a conversational bureaucracy. It is evident today that our most precious resource is the enlightened citizen. Everyone is an expert at something, and many would be willing to participate in the life of our democracy if only given the chance. Il est évident aujourd'hui que notre plus précieuse ressource est un citoyen éclairé. Chacun est un expert pour un domaine donné, et beaucoup seraient heureux de pouvoir participer de la vie démocratique si on leur en donnait la chance. Government does not have all the answers. Yet despite widespread dissatisfaction with government, evident and approval rates that are low all over the world, our public institutions are not designed, not legally, not technically, or culturally, to make use of the expertise of citizens, including government's own employees. L'État n'a pas toutes les réponses. En dépit de mécontentement à l'égard de l'État, suffit de regarder les sondages auprès des jeunes. Nos institutions publiques ne sont pas conçues d'un point de vue légal, technique ou culturel pour bénéficier de l'expertise des citoyens. By contrast, over one million volunteers have been mapping the world on OpenStreetMap since 2004. À côté de cela, des équipes de bénévoles, plus d'un million, ont cartographié le monde sur OpenStreetMap depuis 2004. There is a revolution taking place, a massive outbreak of participation in the domain of science, known as citizen science. Where the people's science movement in the 1960s emphasized making science more accessible to ordinary people, citizen science takes advantage of new technology to make ordinary people participants in actually creating science. Helping understand how galaxies form is one of dozens of such citizen science projects on a site like Zooniverse, a website where scientific researchers enlist volunteer help with tasks that cannot be done by computers alone. Prenons par exemple la participation massive, quasi virale, dans le domaine de la science, plus connue sous le nom de citizen science. Quand dans les années 60, 
the people science movement mette en avance de une science accessible à tous, le phénomène de citizen science profite des avancées dans nouvelles technologies pour faire de citoyens lambdas les nouveaux acteurs et créateurs scientifiques pour euh, comprendre la formation de l'univers en classant la forme des galaxies et un de cas de ces projets sur de ces projets pardon de, sur Zooniverse, un site web où les chercheurs scientifiques recrutent la participation des bénévoles avec des tâches que des ordinateurs ne peuvent pas faire eux-mêmes. So what is to be done? Qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire? Now, with your indulgence, I will switch only to English to, uh, in order that we can have more of a conversation and with a warning to our generous translator here. Um, I'm going to switch only to English uh, so that we can hopefully engage in more of a dialogue about what the next steps look like, about what the things are that we can do to create this kind of conversational culture, to allow us to benefit from the expertise, the insights, the experience, and the skills of those outside the walls, and to enable public servants and citizens to participate actively by contributing their know-how and their talent to tackle today's hard problems. I have observed, and my suggestion, my observation, is that there are seven steps to institutionalizing open and innovative government. The first is, of course, to have a vision. It's to have people like the minister come here today and talk about embracing change at the highest levels. The articulation of high-level principles by important leaders who command popular and media attention and preferably respect as well and legitimacy, is very essential. We could not have had an open government movement in the United States if we had not had President Obama as his first executive action on his first day in office signing the Memorandum on Transparency and Open Government. Similarly, here in Canada, to have as well a open government action plan and now a second open government action plan with forward-leaning, far-reaching, visionary proposals, also proposals like Blueprint 21, excuse me, Blueprint 2020 here in Canada, and other important visionary documents are essential from leading from the top towards innovation and openness in government. The formation of the Open Government Partnership and the symbolic act of having over 60 countries today affirming a charter of open government seizes the imagination and makes us dream of what's possible. The announcement of a commitment by the G8 leaders to disclose the beneficial owners of companies, whom they own, and who owns them, has in turn translated into concrete commitments in Britain, in France, and in Denmark. Last week, the British Secretary of State announced, for example, that all Britons will have an electronic health care record within two years. How they will achieve this? No one knows. The promise is not fleshed out, but having a lofty articulation is a lodestar towards which to navigate. It's very important, let me add, <clears throat> that this vision go beyond the mere vision of transparency as producing government accountability. A promise and a theory that is not fully borne out in practice. That is important, but we must add to it also the embracing, which we heard today, of innovation and of problem solving, of open government as a way to achieve our most important goals, including economic growth, job creation, improvements in healthcare and education, and the things that people care deeply about. So the first question and the first charge that I would put to you is what is the vision here in New Brunswick and who will carry it? for what open government can be, for what government can be for the citizens of Canada. On the second level, though, we can't stop with mere pronouncements. Broad brush principles alone are not enough. We have to transform them in, <coughs> in order to transform institutional culture. We have to have laws. We have to have policies that implement the principles in reality. So whether this means detailed standards, such as the one that got enacted last week in the Open Government Partnership meeting in Costa Rica, to set standards for what open contracting will mean in practice, not just in principle, um, de detailed data standards that govern how public data will be published online, laws that mandate greater citizen consultation, legal frameworks are going to be essential. They include the policies that facilitate innovation, such as laws that make it easier to bring outside talent into government and to send government officials into universities and to companies, and again, to have that 
mélange entre les deux. It might include rules to liberalize how government procures new technology, to make it easier to accept free and open source software, to accept software and other tools and innovations from startups and smaller enterprises, to write an RFP that attracts the most effective unknown solution to a problem, not simply the cheapest vendor of a new solution. So what are the practical steps that can be mandated? What are the laws that need to change? What are the policies that need to be enacted in order to make this kind of innovative government real in practice? One of my great claims to fame, it's not on my bio, is my success at killing New York City's open data law about two or three years ago it was. The reason that I did that, and I can take, in government you can't take any credit, I was an outside advisor, you can't take credit for anything alone, but I came in and said, you should not enact this law because it is merely lofty principles, it's words, and no one in an agency will know what to do with this unless there are specific directions for how to implement it. You have to think about what happens the day after the lofty pronouncement is made, and how to make open government real in a way that serves not government, but real people and their needs and the opportunity to deliver better services to them. Third, platforms. Technology is obviously the linchpin to fostering ongoing and active conversations to bring more diverse ideas into government. It's one thing to have pronouncements and policies on open contracting, and another thing for Georgia, not the state, the country, to put every government every appel d'offre, every government tender on YouTube. Platforms are key for making open data findable in reality, not just in principle. In the US, we have a law which says that charity data must be transparent. But in reality, the IRS, our Inland Revenue Service, will not provide the data, in contrast to Canada, where a platform that is the envy of those of us in the open data world, makes this principle actually real, that you can find the open data about charities. In the US, I might add, when people file, when charities file their taxes electronically, our tax authority uh, prints out those returns, scans them back in, and then puts them on a DVD as an image file. But that is a longer story. <clears throat> Whether, and it's and a true one, whether it is data.gov.ca or data.gov.uk or data.gov, we need a place where we can make data available. The platform is essential. It's the place where people can download the data, but also the platform where people can inventory and list the data that government collects and holds to enable broader conversation about what data should be made available, how openly, and to whom, and in what formats. Platforms will increasingly become vital for helping government to make use of the information it holds, the information it gets from companies, and from citizens to inform how it governs. If open data is to translate into real innovation in how we govern, we need the tools, of course, for visualizing and analyzing that data. So that, for example, we can see which companies, as our Department of Labor has done in the US, have the most workplace safety violations. Uh, and to know how to tar so that we can know how to target scarce enforcement resources when we can only investigate a few complaints. It's very important for us to be able to visualize, <clears throat> for example, where the risk of floods is, in, uh, uh, the, where the risk of floods are the greatest in places that are surrounded by water. I would also commend to you, for example, platforms like Fish Hub, which is a tool for uh, fishermen to manage their catch and their quota using open data, or the global fishing platform, which is making overfishing more transparent and bringing open data to the reform and innovation in the fishing industry. Online platforms are key, uh, of course, for our ability to consult citizens, as is so clear and apparent from, from Canada's own open government second action plan. But it's these new tools like liquid feedback, like liquid democracy, like democracy OS, uh, like discourse, which are making these new civic technologies, most of them open source, many of them free, that are, will make it possible for government to work with citizens in new ways, for government to be able not only to put its data out there, but importantly, and I want to emphasize this point, to inventory what data it has so that we can identify what data sets we should focus on visualizing, what data sets we should focus on using in order to serve our highest priorities. So what number are we up to? Three, 
four? Four. Community. Community and movement. Bringing innovation into government to the end of solving hard problems demands collaboration and co-creation. Government cannot re-engineer itself without help from the outside, as we heard today. This is why Mexico has created an innovators program, and the White House has an innovation fellows program, and the British government digital services hires the best developers who want to do good and give something back. I learned yesterday that out of one of these important recent tech mergers, 50 new millionaires have been created in Fredericton, or at least in New Brunswick. Have they been invited to come do public service? Have they been invited to come serve in government as innovators and entrepreneurs and residents? It is vital to bring in smart and creative talent, in particular tech talent, from outside the walls of government, but also to foster a community and a movement of those agitating for innovation and change. Ooh, let me go to this one. This is not the same as the community that has long advocated for government transparency and accountability, which is largely critical of government, but includes new groups and voices that understand the importance of collaborating with government, not just criticizing it to bring about change. So I'm going to show there's a whole lot of, especially I would say, in an agile, smaller place with 800,000 people, with the opportunity to become a more agile government with a robust collaboration with the technology community to bring in those from outside to use the data sets that are now available and to work with these kinds of organizations to bring about change is going to be vital. Open data by itself does nothing. Openness by itself, transparency by itself, accomplishes little. It's only through this kind of collaboration, which has to, has to be actively invested in, that change will happen. Training. Training and learning are going to be essential to fostering a culture of innovation, especially from the bottom up. Convenings like this one are crucial. Pronouncements, policies, and platforms largely come from the top down. Even things like fellowships pro fellowship programs, which bring in one or two people into an agency, while they're admirable, cannot bring change to a, the larger culture, uh, uh, cannot bring innovation to the larger culture of bureaucracy. Training will be essential. The Inter-American Development Bank, for example, offers training courses for those in Latin America, where government officials, primarily in Mexico, can watch videos about government innovation and interact with each other. The World Bank is launching a course on citizen engagement on Coursera. But innovation has to be spread from the bottom up by connecting innovations and reformers to teach each other and to teach others how innovations uh, can spread. And that is, I think, only through that peer-to-peer -peer mechanism that innovation will spread like a contagion. In Great Britain, for example, the Cabinet Office held an innovation fair this summer to encourage people to show off their innovations to one another in real space, a fair, like a school fair, but with government officials showing off what they'd done. At the White House, the Innovation Gallery online does something similar. In Canada, you are, of course, experimenting all over the country with new communities of practice, such as a nationwide effort to connect those practicing behavioral economics in government. And the spread of public labs and innovation labs, thanks very much in part to the work of Mars, which is not only the work that it does, but the work that it does to convene the community of people in innovation labs and in public labs, is demonstrating how and teaching people how to practice citizen-centered design. At the GovLab and in my own teaching, we are running coaching programs to work with innovators on taking a project from idea to implementation with the support and mentoring of their peers, with the idea being that we want to create and to breed innovators throughout every level of government. Oops. Nice. Another example of uh, Britain's Community of Practice Handbook that they've created in order to uh, get everyone to be able to create a community of practice. And of course, BC's example of its citizen engagement handbook, trying again to get more people to become practitioners of the innovative arts. Evidence. <clears throat> it was with great pleasure that I accepted the invitation to be here today at the Policy Research Network because it is at the forefront and in the, in the lead in helping us to think about what it means to create evidence of what works. It's not enough to, trans to pronounce that open government is good and open data is good or transparency is good with slavish adherence to the mantra. We have to show, as for example the NHS is trying to do, um, that opening up data really will, for example, lead to measurably better health outcomes for patients, 
greater productivity and satisfaction for practitioners, and more efficiency for the taxpayer. We need to undertake more experiments to test what works. The new nudge units that have sprung up in the UK and Australia and the US and now in Canada are consciously experimenting with the choices between policies to see what gets the best results. But we need to couple evidence of it with experimentation so that we can accelerate our progress toward demonstrating what works and when. It's one thing to claim that citizen engagement is the right thing to do, that it's democratically the, the legitimate thing, or that it's the moral thing to do. But we need to understand with evidence when to use citizen participation, at what stage of decision making, with which platforms, and with which audiences does it produce the best results. Through greater collaboration between university and government sectors, as you are doing here, to design, we can design these kinds of A-B tests that help us to accelerate our learning. I'll add just one example that I'm very excited about in the United States is the example of the Food and Drug Administration, which is experimenting now with the uh, uh, testing of the introduction of new platforms for searching for expertise, for searching for smart people within the bureaucracy to serve on its medical device review panels. In other words, this is not about an experiment between the choice of policy A and policy B. It is an experiment to test the difference between using an innovation in government, an innovation in how government makes policy, not which policy, but how it makes policy, and to test whether it works or not. So today, when the agency has the hard job of approving a medical device, a pacemaker or a stent or uh, another potentially life-saving but also life-threatening device that could save lives or kill people, it has the very hard job of getting an expertise quickly. It's introducing new expert networking software, software that will allow it to search its own personnel in the agency and across the broader health ministry for people with the relevant expertise to examine these new devices faster. And as part of that rollout, it is not just undertaking the program, but undertaking testing so that at the end of a six-month period, it can understand whether it worked and whether it didn't. This, I think, is extraordinarily important for backing up an innovation agenda. It's extraordinarily important for when the politicians will be called to account before the legislatures and before the people to explain why they have invested money in citizen engagement, why they have invested money in open data, and why innovation makes sense in terms of serving citizens, not only in terms of serving government. So that, oops, no more pictures. OK, last point. As important as it is to have evidence that, deri that, that derives from experiments, where we try more innovation in government by taking advantage of new technology, backed up by the necessary legal frameworks, high-level pronouncements, in the end, I think what's going to matter most is faith. Faith as much as evidence. The belief that we can design better, more effective, more legitimate, and more democratic ways of governing that will keep us moving forward. I was moved in this, uh, on this point by a poem that I've read by your own poet, Charles Roberts, where he wrote in The Unknown City, this is that city, babe, and seer divined with pure believing mind. This is the home of unachieved emprise. Here, here, the visioned eyes of them that dream past any power to do, wake to the dream come true. I hope that for us, open government, open data, a better government that serves all citizens will be the dream to which we all awake in the very near future. Thank you very much. Merci de votre attention. Okay. I think I'm being told that if there are uh, comments, criticisms, jokes, suggestions, uh, questions I don't know about, but uh, um, that we have some time for discussion. And above all, I, I always like to learn, so please do not feel compelled to ask. You can feel compelled to tell. Hello. Hello. Thank you for an inspirational talk. It was nothing short of inspirational. Thank you very much. I just wanted to ask you, because I'm a cynic. Um, <laughs> please. <clears throat> One of the things that you talked about that caught my ear was the idea of national security and privacy being evoked to block public participation. 
you know, in terms of where, how governing works and how government will keep things from public in the name of national security and privacy. There are cons <coughs> as citizens, that's okay, have, have a drink of water. <laughs> as citizens, we have concerns for privacy and it just occurred to me that perhaps our concern for privacy could be co-opted in a way that further blocks open government. I just wanted to hear your idea on that. Uh, so yes, I think uh, initially, look, for many of you who are working in this space who have daily interactions or discussions about opening up data or being more innovative, you have heard people say, we can't do it because of national security. We can't do it because of privacy. We can't do it. We can't make those charity tax returns available to people because of X, Y, Z. Believe me, I have heard every argument for why those can't be made available, even though there's a law to say they have to be. Um, however, uh, so yes, I think there are, there is a, at the same time, there are very real and robust concerns. Um, you know, in those same tax returns that I keep talking about, they are rife with national ID numbers, social security numbers that are in there and shouldn't be. And if published, you know, we risk disclosing those numbers. Um, we worry, of course, the National Health Service, though it announced a far-reaching policy of opening up data, did so in way, unfortunately, you know, went charging out of the starting gate and, and ended up compromising the privacy and security of patient medical records. Um, these things are hard to do and there is a difficult and necessary conversation. I was at a conference last week called Open Up, which was brought together open government people and privacy people to start to have that conversation. So the point is we have to have a conversation there. And I think that the, the long and the short of it is, I think that inventorying what we have is the most important step towards that conversation. There is no excuse in a democracy for not disclosing the data that we hold and collect. We can then have a conversation about how to make it accessible. So personal health care records that the government holds should be accessible to you, but not to anybody else. You know, certain kinds of data should be anonymized before it's made available. It should be available to researchers, but in a secure form. Only certain kinds of data should be fully publicly, you know, open as the default. We can't have those conversations about where are the limited red lines we should draw to circumscribe national security information of which does exist that should be kept secret and private information that should be ava available only to individuals or under, only under limited, you know, back to yourself. Um, but the what we should be open about is what we have. And I think particularly in the national security context, not to be open about what we collect is the mistake. We can then have a conversation about whether to make it secret or not. Um, one last thing, I'm sorry to go on about this. It's a, obviously a, a topic I care a lot about. Uh, what, after we did our crazy open government consultation where we went out to the American people and we went out to uh, ordinary government workers to ask them what they thought for the first time, the second customer that I had for practicing open engagement on the White House website was none other than the um, national security apparatus to consult the American people on our new declassification policy, which was a very early policy of the administration to revisit what the rules would be on how we classify documents. I got in a lot of trouble for that, I might add. Um, I almost got fired for it when some people were surprised by it. But the powers that be in the national security apparatus were the ones who actively came to us and said, we want to be open about how we have that conversation. Um, so it is not, in national security, there is still room for an open dialogue about, about the appropriate bounds of secrecy. Sorry, I let me be briefer in my replies. Maybe we take a cup, should we take a couple of comments? Or are we, if there are, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name's Jody Carr, um, member of the legislature for the last 15 years, uh, former minister of different portfolios. And um, it's a great pleasure that you're here today. Um, Nick Scott, I want to thank in particular, um, just going through an election. So you've got your ups and downs. What you did uh, for me today, and I think everyone in this room, is, is instill a new sense of faith to not give up in making things better. Um, right from your talking about the problems, real life problems, of how this all works, uh, solutions, opinions, and reflections, 
and also to that believing that it can be better. And the other thing that I was really impressed with is the um, coming to an understanding from each perspective. There's frustration with how things aren't working. And what you were able to show us um, is that there's honorable people in each of these uh, positions, whether it's elected, government civil service, or the community. And you give that perspective of each one of those uh, corners of the triangle want to do better, but there's frustration because there's disconnection. So bringing a sense of awareness of why these problems exist, but then also the solutions. Um, and, and so I just really wanted to say thank you. I love you already. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I, up till now, I had not had the chance or taken the chance to, to read about you and to learn about you and your message. And you've encompassed. I know it's, but if we can't pat each other on the back, who can, right? Uh, and so, Nick, thank you for uh, in, encouraging me to be here uh, today and yesterday. And speaking in both languages. Here, or sorry, are both languages, uh, French and English, here in New Brunswick. I think if we all had the ability to do it, we'd make you an instant honorary citizen of New Brunswick. So thank you very much. <laughs> I'll take it, I'll take it, I'll take it. I, 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 confess, I confess that I have a four-year-old who is bilingual, uh, but who will only speak to me in English because he says, Mommy, you don't speak French. And his, uh, he grew up with a Francophone nanny. Um, and so he speaks French, but refuses to speak to me. So this is not for you, this is for him. <coughs> so that I will go back and tell him and he won't believe it. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. I, uh, I'm, I'm excited by this, this new term I have for, learned this morning, participatory bureaucracy. Not, not mine. Not, well, it's, it's a great one. Um, yeah, it is a great one. Citizen engagement is hard. And it's getting, we learned yesterday that the median or the average age in New Brunswick is now 42.3. And one of the things we struggle with here in the province is how to engage with citizens from all the demographics um, in both official languages. Um, I'm wondering, in your experience, where you have found the sweet spot between the traditional methods of citizen, the old school town hall, telephone polls that just seem so antiquated to some of us, and using technology to try to reach um, the majority of people who want to participate, and, and where that sweet spot is, and how we can merge and, and bring them together. Obviously, citizen engagement is not a new idea. Um, you know, it's been, it's been practiced and promoted since ancient Athens, and clearly we've had lots of ways of doing it that involve, you know, the town hall meeting. Um, as you mentioned, uh, uh, there are lots of examples of um, m doing it face to face, and there are lots of practitioners around the room, including, um, I'm looking at folks from Mars, who are very good at doing citizen engagement in the design of service delivery, so what some people call human-centered design, or in other words, talking to constituents about their needs so that you can co-design a service together. So I think there are lots of opportunities for engagement both online and off, um, particularly in a smaller place. I think the challenge is not, or the risk is, because not all people will participate online is not a reason not to also do things online. And it will often surprise you who will be more likely to participate using the different channels that are available. Um, my mother is of a certain age that she would be mad if I mentioned, um, but, it is, uh, but, she, but she is um, more than 80 and less than 90, and somewhere right in between. Um, <clears throat> and she exists uh, entirely as a life online. She has a Twitter account, she has a Facebook page, she's on, uh, I, I, don't, I can't even keep up with her, it's kind of crazy. She has an, a, an iPhone and an Android phone, Bluetooth hearing aids, and uh, web-enabled, um, motion detector camera things on the back porch that, you know, when a squirrel goes by, it sends her an email. Um, <laughs> it, it's designed to catch thieves and intruders, but it's really like squirrel cam, essentially. Um, the point is, you will often be surprised about it, so it's not just a under or over the median age sort of thing. So I think, uh, yes, the, the point of this is about the cultural shift toward engaging people, and not just engaging people as that after the fact idea, or even at the 
you know, at the tail ends, the beginning or the end of a process, but in the middle with the co-creation and design of solutions. And I think there's, you heard yesterday and you hear today, lots of embrace of this idea that there are entrepreneurs out there, that there are innovators out there, that there are people within the community who have good ideas to share. And that's the one thing I'll just, I'll just say on this point is, uh, my, my concern is, um, is that we tend to equate, we tend to separate the idea of experts and citizens. Citizens are these sort of unwashed masses, they're these nice people, they're our neighbors, but they ain't too bright, and then they're the experts um, who are in government or who are in certain associations and societies or they sit in universities. Um, and what we're missing is the fact that expertise includes not only fancy credentials, like degrees from fancy universities, but it includes people with skills, with experience, including lived experience. Um, and that is very well distributed both within the bureaucracy and in the larger public. And when we get into, when we get a mindset of saying, we're not just going to consult people to ask them how they feel, or what their opinion is, but we're going to consult them to ask them what they know and how they can help and what they can do, that that creates, whether online or off, new kinds of opportunities for engagement. Because the public, the unwashed masses, includes, you know, uh, the minister here who, who, who was here who was a policeman and who was a teacher and therefore is going to have deep, lived, situational awareness experience with what it means to be in those situations, with what it means to be a cop, for example. They are doctors, they are lawyers, they are nurses, they are people who live in specific communities, if we start thinking about citizens as the experts, uh, then we open up new horizons for how we consult and how we engage. The medium doesn't matter. It's the message that people are smart, and we have to give them more ways to engage beyond voting at the ballot box. Did I stop with that? <laughs> <laughs> I have to pick up my I have to pick up my kid from school. So my my, bo my boss is waiting for me. <laughs> Thank you, and I hope um, I really say if I may add one other word, which is um, I came. I'm sorry that I don't have enough time to spend time with you because we at the Gov Lab, I speak on behalf of all my colleagues, would very much welcome the chance to collaborate and to talk more um, about the work that you're doing here and to share the work that we're doing and to keep up with what's going on. And if I'm now an honorary citizen and uh, you love me that much, then you will uh, invite me back to come on vacation here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Euh, d'avoir entrepris de, de faire votre présentation en français. Je pense que c'est un, un respect qu'on oublie même souvent nous autres mêmes. C'est une belle leçon, leçon d'humilité. Donc, euh, merci. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as, you, as you heard, I think uh, Beth's going to be willing to engage again with the community here, which is great, and the GovLab. And uh, this afternoon uh, is all about talking about how we move to the solutions part of it. And you heard a few kind of snippets of how it's been done elsewhere and how it could be done here. Uh, whether it be through solutions labs, whether it be through engaging more talent, external talent within government or essentially in a shared space with government to tackle some of the solutions, looking to entrepreneurs within the system. There's tons of ways that we can get at this and, and certainly this afternoon will be about kind of cornering those big challenges with, uh, and, and uh, looking at how we can actually execute on them. So time for a break to kind of digest this great talk. Talk amongst yourselves, get excited. At uh, 10.30, we have another uh, uh, speaker who has the habit of, of motivating, certainly me, uh, a, a partner in crime of mine. So uh, it'll be a great talk, and we'll talk about how we kind of give this, uh, this challenge or, or pull in mill millennials to this challenge to help us drive this forward. So take a break. There's going to be food in there, I'm sure. Uh, you know, the bathroom's over there. For those of you who smoke, there's not many left. Uh, it's outside, just on the left there. I'm one of them, so I got to mention it. <laughs>